This morning we continue our series through this journey to the empty tomb as we continue to march our way towards Resurrection Sunday. And this morning we are in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13 and verses 1 through 9. And uh, if you turn there or if you're in the process of turning there, uh, what we're going to see in the introduction to this chapter is Jesus correcting some bad theology. Uh, Jesus correcting some misinformed theology. And by that, I'm, we'll see what that, how that plays out, but understanding that if you immerse yourself in the Old Covenant, that there's a basic equation with the Old Covenant. That in the Old Covenant, if you obey God, if you are righteous and holy, that God will bless you and prosper you. And if you are disobedient, then God is going to remove his hand from you and you will face trials and hardships and everything is going to go amok. Uh, the problem with that theology is Job, uh, but we'll save that for another time. It, it's the kind of thinking that I could have had yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I had to replace, I'm not a mechanic. Um, I, John is more of a mechanic in his right pinky fingernail than I am in my entire person. But I figured, I had, I had a headlight out, and so I figured I can change a bulb. And so I got the bulb and went back to the house and propped the hood up and got in there, took the cap thing off. And in the process of changing this tiny little light bulb is when all of a sudden this rain and wind picked up out of nowhere. It blew the hood up, which then that little arm that holds the hood up, that came crashing down, which then the hood came crashing down upon my head. And it still hurts. And in that moment, I could have said, Lord, what did I do wrong? How have I sinned that you've brought this hardship upon me? That's the old covenant thinking that Jesus is correcting as we come to Luke chapter 13. Where it says, starting in verse 1, there were some present, and this is referring to the crowds uh, back from chapter 12, at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. <clears throat> or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So again, there's this understanding that, well, here's some people who suffered. We don't know a lot about what's being referenced here, but people who were making sacrifices to God and because of the Roman government, they were slaughtered and as they were making their sacrifices. And so the question comes up, well, certainly they must have been sinners because of the suffering that came upon them. Uh, maybe you've been a part of those churches where, uh, at least I was for a short season, where if you walked in the church and, and had a sniffle, you better do it quietly because somebody was going to pull you aside and ask what unconfessed sin was in your life, that you've got this sickness and this ailment. It's called ragweed, um, but that's another matter. But they're assuming that because these individuals suffered and because those who the 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, that they must have been sinful because God was punishing them through allowing these, this suffering, this, these bad circumstances into their lives. But, but Jesus says, no, it has nothing to do with it. Sometimes horrible things happen. It wasn't because they were sinners, but Jesus uses this as an opportunity to turn the tables on them. Because again, we have that self-righteous mentality of they're going through bad things and so therefore they must be sinful. I'm not going through bad things and so therefore I must be righteous. Jesus is like, no, <laughs> no. He says, in fact, not only were they not worse sinners because of their suffering, but I say to you in the middle of your not suffering that unless you repent, you will perish. Maybe not a tower falling on you, but each person individually needs to repent. The word repent here is metanao, which is to think differently, to change your mind. It's to change the course of your life, to change the direction of how you live. 
Jesus is calling them to turn away from their sinful ways, to turn away from not recognizing him as the Messiah, to surrender their lives to him. Because it would be easy for them. I mean, these were likely, if we understand the context, this question was posed to Jesus by Jewish people. Who again could have very easily said, well, we're Jewish, we are the covenant people of God, and so therefore we are favored by God. And we are right with God simply because we're Jewish. And the modern equivalent of that is, well, I go to church and so therefore I'm a Christian. Or I was raised in a Christian home, therefore I'm a Christian. Or I go to a Christian school and so therefore I must be a Christian. But the matter of being a follower of Christ has nothing to do with where you put yourself physically. Just as Jesus is letting these Jewish people in this context know that just because of how you were born, it doesn't mean you're right with God. What makes one right with God is that individual choice of repentance and turning to Christ for salvation. But then he adds to this, picking up at verse 6, by telling a parable. It says, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Jesus is incorporating this parable to fundamentally say that if you want to know if you're right with God or not, the thing to do is to look at your life and examine the fruit. Is there fruit of following Christ? Is there fruit of righteousness being produced in your life? And he's using the parable here of a fig tree that didn't bear any fruit. And so what's happening here is the landowner is saying, well, it's, it's not producing fruit. Cut it down. Get rid of it. I can put a healthy tree in its place and get the fruit that I want. But the gardener says, well, hold on a second. Let me try something. Let me kind of dig around it. Let me clear out the, around the roots. Let me kind of get in there and treat it and see if that makes a difference. And if not, you know, then you can cut it down. But maybe, just maybe, that will do the trick. So he gives it a year. But he's given it now. Where it says in verse 6, A man had, planted a, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now. Notice that. For three years, it has not been producing fruit. And so the gardener says, Well, let's just let's give it one more year. Now notice that the, the man who owned the tree, after one year, didn't give up on it. He didn't give up on it after the second year, but in the third year, he's like, okay, there's a problem. At most, we're going to give it one more year. John chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Again, he's responding to a group of Jewish people who assume that because they were born Jewish and because they haven't gone through suffering, therefore they must be right with God. Jesus says, no. I want to look at the fruit of your life. And that's going to indicate not the existence or absence of suffering, but the existence or absence of fruit is going to determine whether or not or prove whether or not you are right with God. But notice what happens here. Notice how as they look at this barren fig tree, they don't say, well, we need to fix the branches. Let's, uh, let's kind of hoist up the branches. Let's spray something on the branches. Let's kind of... Uh, put some fake fruit, and so therefore the rest of the tree might be tricked to producing fruit. Notice what the plan is. We're going to dig around this thing. We're going to get down to the roots. Now, the problem is a lack of fruit, right? It's what's coming off the branches or what's not coming off the branches. And so the solution is let's get down at the root level. 
and see what's going on. There's wisdom there for us as followers of Jesus. John chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce fruit. Not because you exerted the effort to produce the fruit, not because you tried really hard to produce the fruit, but because naturally these fruit will be evident in your life. So if there's a lack of fruit, what happens? Well, we could very easily say, well, this person claims to have been following Jesus. It's been three months or it's been a year and we're not seeing a lot of fruit, so let's give up on it. Notice how the gardener says, well, one year, two years, okay, it's growing, it's young. But in this third year, there's still no fruit, there's a problem. And again, he doesn't just treat the branches. He gets down to the root. He gets down to the core issue. And we can sit back and say, well, I, I was raised in a Christian home. I was raised in the church or uh, I've always been in church. And so therefore, I must be a follower of Jesus. How's the fruit? Is there fruit of Christ's likeness being produced in your life? Now, notice that it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Sometimes we like to think, well, I surrender my life to Jesus, and so the next day I should be exactly like Jesus. I wish it happened like that. It doesn't usually. Just like this tree, a year might go by and there's no real evidence of fruit. Maybe even two years, maybe into a third year. But at some point, there should be fruit. And if there's not... There's a root problem. I, I had a friend who was caught up in always looking at people who claim to be Christians. And he'd look at their claim, look at their lives and say, they must not be a Christian. So, slow down. What we can conclude, maybe you know somebody who says, yes, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, but their lives clearly exhibit something completely contrary to following Jesus. And you can say, well, they're clearly not a Christian. There's a relationship problem. There's a root problem. Something's going on at the very foundation of their life. Maybe they don't know Christ, and that's why there's no fruit being produced. Maybe there's just a lot of stuff in the way, and there's not a lot of life getting into the roots. I've become less concerned about trying to decide who is and who is not a follower of Jesus, and more concerned about if there's not a lot of fruit, let, let's, let's treat the roots and see what, what's going on here. And treating the roots of life is difficult. You know, I would much rather like cut a couple inches off a branch here and off a branch here, but when you've got to like dig and get your hands dirty and, and dig around the base of that tree and get down to the roots, it's a hot, sweaty, dirty mess. I'm more of an indoors kind of guy. I'd rather read a book than dig my hands and plunge my hands into dirt. But it's necessary. And sometimes in our lives, Jesus digs down to the root of our heart. And our initial response can be, whoa, whoa I don't like that. But sometimes it's necessary. If we long to see the fruit of Jesus being produced in our lives. So all of this begins with people saying, well, here are some people who claim to be people of Yahweh, but they suffered, and so therefore they were terrible sinners. And Jesus says, that has nothing to do with it. But he turns it on them and says, what about you? Are you truly followers of God? Are you followers of the Messiah? Don't worry about them and why that happened to them. Let's look at our own hearts. Are we following Jesus? What's the fruit that's being produced? In fact, the question I want us to wrestle with, and maybe on your notes or in your bulletin, write down a few initial thoughts and continue it this week, but how is your fruit? How is the fruit of your life? Because so often, and if you pay attention to news, 
it, it's amazing and it's discouraging and defeating as we see evangelical leader after evangelical leader being exposed for some horrific activity or covering up horrific activity. And we have this mentality over the past several decades where we just need to get people to pray a prayer. And so we get them to pray a prayer and then they're good. You know, we, we chopped one up for eternity and now we don't have to worry about them. And there's not a lot of focus on, are we looking more like Jesus? Because that doesn't just happen naturally. Say, so, well, I pray to prayer and I go to church on Sunday, so what else do I need to do? There's a constant surrendering, a constant filling of the Holy Spirit. I would invite us to look at the fruit of our lives. Say, in what ways is my life looking more like Jesus? Not because I've got this whole Christian thing down, because none of us do, but because of the presence of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, these things are just happening. I'm not getting as irritable as I used to get, or I'm not being as impatient as I used to be, or I'm, I'm finding it easier to love people who are difficult to love. But what kinds of fruits are we seeing in our lives to see things are going well in my relationship with Jesus? What would we point to? Say, yeah, I, I can see this. I can see how God's working here. I can see how he's changing me in this area. Can we see the fruit of the Spirit? The evidence of Jesus being produced through our lives. And because it can be easy to fool ourselves and say, well, yeah, I'm the most Jesus-like person in the world. Ask those around you. In what ways are they seeing Jesus? And find honest people, not just those like, oh, you're very godly. But people who will tell you the truth. Say, well, there's some areas that could use some work. And it's not going to be a quick, easy process. Again, even after they address the roots and put some fertilizer and really treat the roots of this tree, the, the gardener says, let's give it another year. It's going to take some time. Are we willing to examine our lives on a regular basis and say, Jesus, how am I seeing you change me? How am I seeing you transform me? How am I different than I was a year ago? How am I more like Jesus than I was a year ago? In what ways am I experiencing victory over sin? In what ways am I showing more love to people around me? How am I becoming more like Jesus? Because we can very easily be like this crowd of Jewish people and, and we can sit back and kind of look and point fingers at everybody else. And well, clearly they're not following the Lord. Clearly they're not spiritual enough. But Jesus says, don't worry about that. What about your heart? How is our heart? How is our fruit? Is there evidence that Jesus is at work in us and through us?